Kunuzda xarici yurt vakilleri bilen suhbet layıhasını devam ettiremiz. Bugünkü kursatuğumuz mehmanı, Bangladeş'in Uzbekistan'daki fakulatta ve muhtar ilçisi Canab Masud Mennem. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Mr. Ambassador, first of all let me express my deep gratitude for the warm received in the embassy and to organize to uh, to have that partnership to organize this beautiful interview with you you are most welcome thank you uh, let me start our uh, interview with a question that mr ambassador you've been appointed to uzbekistan uh, uh, as well as uh, in kyrgyzstan uh, afghanistan it's accredited uh, in kazakhstan as well and what were your perceptions about the region about the states before you were appointed in tashkent Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a very good question. But actually, I've already passed four years of my life mm -hmm. in this beautiful Central Asian region. Before coming here, I knew, I will not say too much about this country in details, but I knew something. You will ask why? Because we have common history. Under the Baburids, Indian subcontinent was for around 325 years. And that's why it has become a part of our history. When we study in the school, even from the primary level, especially when I was in the school level, there were uh, small uh, chapters which described their system of administration, what development works they did, and their achievements. I'm talking about the Baburids. Mm -hmm. yes, you can say Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangi, Shah Jahan, Arangazeb. Um, uh, according to the British historians, they're called the Great Mughals. Mm -hmm. So we had to study them from when we were very, very little kids. Secondly, uh, during the War of Liberation of Bangladesh in 1971, at that time Soviet Union helped us a lot. And as a part of Soviet Union, three republics, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyz, Republic, all of their people also extended their support to us. And just after independence, the Soviet Cultural Center, which started working in Dhaka from 1972, it was located very near to my home. So I frequented the library regularly as a university student, uh, first as a school student and then as a college and university student, and learned a lot from the books about these republics. At that time there were 15 republics. So that was my second source of information about how quickly Soviet Union and its republics developed in the last century. I'm talking of the 20th century. Finally, I also learned a lot, not only from watching films made in Moscow and Tashkent, but also preparing for my civil service exam to join the foreign service. Yeah. I chose the history of Indian subcontinent, two papers on them. And when you talk about India, Indian subcontinent's history at university level, of course, the 325 years plus of the rule of the Baburids come. You have to learn it by heart in details and then do good to get qualified as an officer. So I did it. That's why you are seeing me here now. So all these things helped me to study the history, the development work, and the cultural heritage of Central Asia as part of my studies. I also took personal interest, I don't know what's the reason, uh, to learn more about uh, the architecture and other things, which actually, I think, uh, I guess, since we had some of the monuments and palaces in our capital, mm -hmm. Dhaka, which was built under one of the Subedar of Jahangir and is also known as Jahangir Nagar. Since we have those establishments, I'm talking about monuments and mosques and palaces in Dhaka, maybe they also put some impression on my mind and I started liking the architecture, the unique kind of architecture. We call Mughal architecture, you will call Uzbek architecture Islamic. It's our Islamic architecture. That also gave me an idea about the Central Asian culture and architecture. Finally comes music and other things, music and cuisine. 
when I grew up, from my grandparents and parents, I came to know, especially about the cuisine. Whenever there was a big occasion like wedding and other things, people said these things came with the Mughals, means the Uzbeks, the Babulids. And in the uh, old part of Dhaka city, which was, as I already mentioned, built during Jahangir's uh, rule, uh, actually uh, those things came. And there are some people who still follow because of their uh, maybe inheritance and everything, traditional things like from the, that period, a mm -hmm. couple of hundreds back. So uh, we test all, all the time for big occasions, something to do with Central Asia. It doesn't mean only today's Uzbekistan, it's the whole region. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, it was not called Uzbekistan 500 years ago, or 350 years ago. Yeah. So uh, in this way, I also learned about the cuisine, like you can call biryani, shashlik, different kind of kebabs, and also your special kind of bread. That is not so known in my part, but there are something similar to it. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when you talk about a non, mm -hmm. we call nan, nan roti, roti means bread. So these kind of things all came from this part of the world. And I just, I'm, I was just forgetting to talk again about music. Uh, when you think about using uh, instruments to play the music, a very common thing is dutar, which we call dutara. And not only in the capital of Dhaka, this dutara is very popular all over Bangladesh in the rural area. And Bangladesh still today is mainly an agrarian based country, I mean agriculture based, village based country. So you can understand how popular this small instrument Dutari is all over Bangladesh. And it also had in impact on my learning about Central Asia. So in nutshell, these are, these are the things I knew even when I was a university student preparing myself to become an, you know, part of the government. Uh, I knew about Central Asia and then I learned a little bit more just when I was appointed as ambassador like everybody does and came to your beautiful country. Mr. Manan, you've been uh, serving in Uzbekistan for a long period, if we may say it. And uh, what changes you've been uh, witnessed in Uzbekistan for this period? What are the, uh, I mean, uh, the dynamics in the economy, in the politics, in society you, you, you've seen? In this period? As I told, I have just completed four years in September this year. So, uh, to me, yes, I have seen few things. Uh, I forgot to mention that before coming as ambassador formally, I was invited by our second ambassador mm -hmm. to Uzbekistan, Mr. Mohsan Ali Khan, to visit this beautiful country when he was serving here. And I come, came here first time actually in 1999 mm -hmm. after you became an independent country out of Soviet Union. And in 1999, what I saw, the development, extent of development at that time, under the dynamic leadership of your first president, late Mr. Islam Kolimov, actually when I came in 2013, I saw there have been drastic changes. Not only beautiful roads, highways, and uh, mansions have been built, there have been total change in not only the look, but in the mentality of the people, as the, uh, as the part of a sovereign and independent country, mm -hmm. very proud of their heritage. Because we should remember, Uzbek people have more than several thousand years old history yes. and history of success. And that history is not just of conquering countries, it's a history of education, science, philosophy, proud of their own religion, especially Islam. All these things together and several thousand years, maybe within the frame, I mean within the boundaries of Uzbekistan, it's just independent this time from 1991. Mm -hmm. But as a nation they have been existing several thousand years. It's a big thing. So I found that thing to come back in the mind of the people when I came in 1999, that it has already started coming and it was very distinct 
because the success started to pay off when I came in 2013 under the leadership of late President Islam Kolyumov. So that was the first change I saw that the emancipation of people when they get the chance to be a member or a citizen of a sovereign and independent country. You can feel it, not just the look, mm -hmm. just the feelings of the people that they are sovereign. They represent a sovereign nation. So that I found first. Secondly, I saw and came to know on the second or third year of my second year of my stay here from a conference where uh, the late president reminded the people, especially the youth of your country, mm -hmm. that you have 63% yes. of the population very young and they are the future and they should not only be happy with their past and show respect to their seniors, but at the same time they should be innovative and they should try to build a nation with new development work, new scientific innovation and showing respect to the past and being proud of their success of several thousand years. Mm -hmm. He had a big conference where diplomats were invited, so I still remember. So that was another thing to be pointed out and to be encouraging the younger generation what to do to guide them as their mentor, the main mentor of the country. That was another thing. Many countries forget to specially inspire their younger generation who are actually the future of a nation or of a country. So that I liked very much. Thirdly, I was very happy to see your success, which was coming and everybody knows that you have been good in sports and chess all over the world knows. But the success came only few, I said one and a half year ago, in the Olympics and in the Paralympics. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, after that, late president passed away. But he also rejoiced the success very happily. And we also felt the whole nation was happy. So that was another thing to channelize the energy of the youth into this particular field of activity and get the success on the world stage yes. to involve and uh, to explore the possibilities successfully. That is also a big thing, which was not there in 1991 or even 1999, but by 2016, 16, last year, you already achieved it. So that was another big thing to get the best out of your younger generation in at least the field of sports and if you call games then chess as well you did very well finally came with the new president mr shafkat mizioyev another big thing dialogue with the people when he announced his new strategy for five years mm -hmm. He already told that he will bring government close to the people and have regular dialogue. And he also emphasized on capacity building of the bureaucracy to make them more efficient and other things and corruption free. Plus, he wanted to have more, bit, not only more, relationship was already there, better relation with the neighboring countries, making the focus of his foreign policy the neighbors. There was a conference as well. Yes. And at the same time, you are not forgetting your heritage. Mm -hmm. You are again this week having a program in Samarkand on your past, which is a glorious past. So he is keeping in mind his glory, but he's looking forward, like other countries in the world, to the future with democracy, good governance, rule of law, openness, you understand? Yeah. And how to develop more business with other friendly nations. So these things are fantastic. So I've already mentioned several changes, but we shouldn't forget. Another thing I didn't mention so much because I thought, since you already know, a sovereign country will always have a lot of development. It is expected from the leadership in the infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, though I didn't mention it, I should have, when I just came out of the plane in 1999, first and foremost was how the country looks. But when I came in 2013, I saw a big difference because within that framework of time, 
14 years, 1999-2013, already you have built such a beautiful Tashkent, such a clean and secure Tashkent that it won my heart. So you can understand from infrastructure building to youth and to success in sports and then to dialogue with the people with new policy to open up and become more successful as a nation, as a developed country. So many things have done I have noticed in last four years. This is also a new epoch we call it. Uh, and there are unique bilateral economic, uh, socio-cultural relations between our countries, mm -hmm. between Bangladesh and Uzbekistan. It's demonstrated in the term of the light industry and textile also. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future of these economic cooperations between two countries, two states, and what aspect of partnership uh, still need to be developed in further? In one word, I not only see, I believe there is a great potential mm -hmm. between Bangladesh and Uzbekistan in many sectors, especially light industry. And I understand when you say textile, uh, yes, because today's Bangladesh in last 30 years, because we started in the, uh, it's a little more than over 30 years, we started in the 80s, 10 years after our independence, to develop our ready-made garments and knitwear sector. Mm -hmm. So it's an excellent time now, when if we explore all of our uh, positive uh, strength in economy, I'm talking about both Uzbekistan and Bangladesh, there are great potential to explore and there can be many situations created from where we can have win-win situation to help each other and get the best out of whatever we have today. And sky is the limit. Why I'm telling so? Because your cotton, let me start with textile, your cotton is one of the finest cotton produced on earth, the quality of the cotton. Using it already Bangladesh is producing good variety of clothes and selling it to the world. And you know after China, and soon we will inshallah become number one. We are number two now after China in the whole world in selling ready-made garments, textile products. So there is a lot of avenue of opportunity which can be explored to have this cotton regularly to be supplied to Bangladesh and be successful. But I know your government is now thinking, why not we also produce our own ready-made garments? That is also possible. We can have joint venture. Yes. We can have the opportunity of using your uh, energy sources. I'm talking about gas and electricity. Mm. Also, you have skilled labor especially uh, your people are educated. We can train them up with our uh, experience, Bangladeshi managers and designers and as already skilled laborers. They can help their friendly country people to develop skill in this particular field while having a joint venture here. And then we can explore the possibility of entering the vast market of CIS and Russia because still today, Bangladesh is approaching or having good business with European Union, country, I mean EU countries, as well as USA and Canada. Or on the other side, Korea, Japan, plus maybe uh, some of our neighboring countries. But why not the big former Soviet Union republics? Mm -hmm. And to approach them or to enter or access their market, it will be better to have a partner like Uzbekistan. So you can have joint ventures on the soil of Uzbekistan, sometimes for specialized things, maybe in Bangladesh, have the managerial skill and designing skill and other expertise from Bangladesh, but some labor from your country. And also, as I am repeating again, have the benefits of uh, the you know, uh, competitive price of gas, electricity, water, land, in Uzbekistan and then through those market access to the CIS and Russian big vast market you have the additional uh, profit from this part of the world which Bangladesh is already having with Europe and America. This is a big opportunity. 
from where both the countries can benefit. This is in the field of cotton and textile. So your cotton also continues to be produced. It comes to Bangladeshi uh, productions, but maybe not has to go all the way to, because if the joint venture is here, we can do it here. So some transport cost is cut, I mean, not needed, but we benefit mm -hmm. and have big market, more profit, and that profit we use for another industry. You will say, what can be the another industry? Yes. Another light industry can be pharmaceuticals. Of course. It's not uh, that it is not possible because you have a lot of need and it is still not so developed in Uzbekistan. You still uh, import it from neighboring countries and sometimes from Europe, some European countries. In the past, you used to do it from Russia as well. So without naming many countries, I can say Bangladesh produces very high generic variety, high quality generic variety uh, pharmaceutical products. We already export it to the world, not only to neighboring countries, to African countries, some East European countries. Why not to Central Asian countries, I mean CIS countries, including Uzbekistan in a big way. You will be happy to know we have already signed some of the Mm -hmm. joint venture agreement, seven of them. Seven of them. Yeah, already. So why not materialize them now? Some obstacles are always there. Just signing things are not enough to bring out money and invest at the same time, take back the profit. Now the new government of President Mizioyev have already given opportunity to repatriate the profit. Yeah. You know that. So why not explore or avail those opportunities? So we, I will personally, as ambassador, encourage those people who were involved in joint venture from the Bangladesh side to now try to materialize without further delay what agreements they have already signed and encourage other companies, pharmaceutical companies in Bangladesh to have joint venture with Uzbekistan and other Central Asian countries. So that is another field where we can have possibilities in light industry. Light industry, I think for the time being, these two, we should first experience how we do as partners mm -hmm. by explore, I mean, uh, working in these two fields, not to dilute ourselves too much or other light industry things. Even it can happen that in that aspect, you can consider having some of your things in light industry as joint venture in Bangladesh because maybe you have more comparative advantage in expertise. I'm talking, not talking about labor and other things in case of expertise and managerial uh, experience and then you will like to bring it to Bangladesh in return of these two mm -hmm. textile and pharmaceuticals. I will not name any of them now but in the near future after we become successful in this, we can, uh, you know, look into other possibilities. We we'll, we'll look also forward for this cooperation and partnership between the countries, not all the Uzbekistan and Bangladesh, but uh, whole the Central Asian and Bangladesh. Mr. Ambassador, the Central Asian states as well as uh, Bangladesh uh, is considered as a Muslim society living countries. And we all uh, witnessed uh, what happened in August with Rohingya's uh, community in Myanmar. And how do you see the constructive solution for this problem to be uh, tackled forever in the region? Because uh, it took the heart of the many Muslims uh, as well as in Uzbekistan and uh, the country also pays at risk for this royal community and uh, wanted to help them. Thank you very much. A very pertinent and timely question. Uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the government and the people of Uzbekistan for reaching out to the uh, displaced population of Myanmar who entered uh, Bangladesh this time for on 25th August and the uh, uh, they are still coming, mm -hmm. but I'm deep, I was deeply touched. I'm still very thankful from the core of my heart and my government, the government of Bangladesh, is also very thankful to the government of President Mizioyev and 
the people of Uzbekistan for reaching out. It was very timely and at the same time very kind and we are very grateful. Now on the question of solution, it's a, not a new phenomenon. Yes. You know from 1978, I'm talking about after Bangladesh becoming, became independent in 1971, 1978 we saw the first big influx of Rohingyas, South Asian people, not just Muslim, some are non-Muslims, they entered under the pressure of the Jonta, at that time ruling Myanmar, they entered uh, Bangladesh, took shelter. Negotiation went on, some went back, some stayed and are still there. Then in the 90s also we had similar thing. It, it, it repeated several times. This time it is a very big number of displaced population coming from Myanmar. For sure they are the population of Myanmar. Whatever the people say, since they are neighboring people, like you have in your neighborhood, people of same look, but they are not Uzbek. They live on the other side of the border. They were born there. Maybe they look alike because once upon a time there were no borders. There were intermarriages. But now, from 1948, Myanmar, previously known as Burma, is an independent country. And this is 2017, going to be 2018 soon. So 70 years of independence, mm -hmm. 1948 to 2018, now 69 years. How can it still not think that these people who have been living there for centuries were born there and not their citizens? This is not a kind consideration. People, after a few years <clears throat> uh, staying somewhere, having commitment, having legal protection, and at the same time serving that nation, eventually, according within the rules of the country, there are options they become to become citizen of that country. Everywhere in the world, I think Myanmar is no uh, exception. But what Myanmar is doing now, they're pushing many, not one or two people, more than half a million people, as our Prime Minister said yesterday uh, in a, a meeting to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association of uh, a, a meeting in Bangladesh, that more than 600,000 people, displaced Myanmar people, have already entered Bangladesh, almost 700,000, it's a big number. Soon it will reach in this way million. <clears throat> it's not a normal situation. Mm -hmm. That's why, as you said correctly, we also want a permanent solution. It is happening from 78, the big influx. Every few years, the size is growing of displaced population. There should be a permanent solution. I'm a career diplomat. I'm not a person who forecasts the future. But I think this should be done through understanding and negotiation between the two countries with the help of friendly nations under the auspices of mm. United Nations. Mm. There are many points. First, what you did is to give them shelter and food, food and then medical treatment, if necessary, other amenities of life. They will need it because they are almost reaching 700,000 now. This is a must. Secondly, which we have already started, a regular dialogue between the two governments of Bangladesh and Myanmar, which has started. You know, very recently our mm -hmm. interior minister, we call Minister for Home Affairs, visited Myanmar. And before that, one of the representatives of the state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, also visited Bangladesh. So this kind of dialogue should continue and it should be a fruitful dialogue with some outcome. Mm -hmm. And it should show understanding that this thing is not correct. Pushing people out who have been settled in a country for centuries and from their own conscience, they should think they are our brothers and sisters and we should all be kind to them. And since this land actually several thousand years ago also, where an independent country called Arakan, 
So why not at least they stay in their own part of, within our structure of Myanmar, I mean the country, but at least have a, in, at least have a uh, comfortable life as a human being in, in this 21st century to be persecuted and thrown out or displaced from somebody's own uh, houses and having, an, uh, um, having no definite future for their children, for their family, family for their uh, you know, health situation, everything. That is not good. That is very, very unfortunate. And I hope under the, uh, uh, under the guidance of friendly countries and the United Nations, very soon this thing will start happening. You know about the Kofi Annan, you know, Kofi Annan gave a, an outline of how to solve this problem. And our Prime Minister also gave her five point proposals. So I hope all these things will start being materialized in the coming days. Yes, we also hope that these recommendations and this project will mm -hmm. uh, work in the practice. Jano, it's Uzbekistan, Bangladesh, Humatani, Uzman Fatlare, the Madani at the Halkani Rodas and Ifo data, the Ubuir, the Consulic Hizmatlare, Siosi, Madani, Alokala, Saudi, Alokala, and the Washland, the Shaplan, Lokatos, Ikha, or Testig, Alokala, and the Washland, the Shaplan, Mr. Ambassador, how does it feel to be a good diplomat? In your eyes? In my eyes, a good diplomat should have the habit of always trying to update himself with information and have a habit of reading a lot of books to also improve his knowledge level, mix with people. I am not telling he has to be extraordinarily outgoing, but he should have an attitude of reaching out to people and have the negotiation skill. Plus, he should love the culture of the country where he has posted so that he can understand the feelings and the nature of the people. Culture is very important. He should. Uh, try to solve problem with the standing of course of his country but with some initiative and passion mm -hmm. uh, because if you try don't try seriously to go into depth of a challenge or a problem or a puzzle to solve how will you help the people you have to have that passion so he should be to some extent passionate about his work 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 he should be very dedicated to his work and he should also learn how to play as a team member not be individualistic he should have a good team to cooperate with because this is very very important mm -hmm. now you are telling this is for a diplomat how to be a good diplomat he should also know if possible which many of us don't have have good language skill Language actually makes you close to the country where you are working. So if you know the language, you reach out very quickly. Mm -hmm. Language skill is very, very good. And then if he has some other, he knows or he, he has the skill of some other amenities of modern life, whether it is social networking or operating on the computer very well or know how to talk to the people in small group and big group, I mean, speaking, public speaking ability, these things are also very helpful to be a successful or a good diplomat. I have seen Kofi Annan very closely during my time in New York, how good and great he has been as an orator. These things are good for a diplomat as well, even a, a young diplomat. Uh, diplomats should also um, cultivate some hobbies. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have some hobbies, how will you reach out to some individual people or group. Say, if you love a theater, you go to the theater, you meet some people, you talk about and discuss about theater or music or paintings, going to the exhibitions or music uh, presentation. 
musicals. This helps to cultivate a group of people and make friends, long-lasting friends. These are also very much needed. Many diplomats don't cultivate these things very seriously. But culture or cultural diplomacy is also a, a way of you know, approaching the people very successfully and reaching to their heart and having long-lasting friend, not for the individual diplomat, for his country, mm -hmm. making long-lasting impression. So culture is very important and that's why I'm selling some hobbies or some cultural activities. If the diplomat is involved in, it will be helpful. This is just my personal suggestion. And if you ask, finally, finally, as a senior diplomat, I think uh, a habit should be there to write things, not just writing a diary, write things and share your experience of life mm -hmm. with the next generation. This, you can do some through uh, office channel, I mean reports and other things. Some you can do after retirement by writing books or biographies, autobiographies I mean. So these are the things a diplomat can do, which will be a little different than other bureaucrats or other public servants. And what failure do you admire amongst your experience? We didn't understand. That, I will agree, was the failure of not only me, maybe the diplomatic world. We didn't see that coming, 9-11. Uh, One big uh, duty of a diplomat is to try to read about the future as well what's going to happen next. Because we always deal with information. Depending on the current information and the, what is happening around you, from that information you learn in the world, you should try to or be able to forecast something about the future. Not as a for, fortune teller. I'm talking about as a human being. That since these things are not coming to a solution, the problem or challenge or whatever, maybe this can happen next. Nobody saw, even the day before, I was at them posted in New York, the next day, early in the morning, I was in the United Nations building with Mr. Kofian and others having a breakfast meeting. Nobody even thought that while we are having a, a, a breakfast meeting, the whole world is represented there, two planes will come and hit the Trade Center, World Trade Center, and demolish them, and the world will change. The security system will change. Our thought process will change. And things what started happening in Afghanistan and Iraq will start so drastically. Did we even forecast those things the day before? If you tell me as a diplomat, for me or the whole diplomatic world, that was a great failure. And that was what I will agree, uh, that shouldn't have happened. We should at least be able to think and forecast what might come in, if not tomorrow, in a few months. Mm -hmm. That should be a big task for the diplomat. Thank you. And uh, your passion and wishes to the nation of Uzbekistan and the whole countries of the Central Asian states? Uh, my uh, best wishes to the people of Central Asia will be to, as you said correctly, to collaborate among themselves, the five countries, to extend themselves to neighboring countries and collaborate with us. We are friendly nations. Through the Baburids, especially, we are having sharing the same history. Uh, we have many things of similar nature, like we speak language where you have many words similar. We enjoy the same cuisine, culture, religion. Why not we collaborate more, have more economic understanding and integration, and face the world together positively with business and culture. Yes. This is my clarion call to the people and the governments of Central Asia and beyond. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, thank you, thank you for your uh, fruitful, meaningful interview talk and receive in embassy. We hope also that uh, this cooperation and partnership will last for centuries, for a long time. And uh, the bilateral relations between Uzbekistan and Bangladesh will grow and will show that high effect and dynamics. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.